our golden year today, chosen by Martin Fry of ABC, Frame. Martin, how are you? Very well indeed, sir. It's what a pleasure to be here, it's Ken. Lovely to see you. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Good. And 1972 is the year you've gone for. Why that year? Well, if you were making a film, uh, a coming-of-age film about me, Martin Fry, it would all take place in 1972 because I was born in the late 50s. And I was kind of around about 13 or 14 years old in 1972. So okay. it was that wonderful period in everybody's life when you first get a chance to make your own decisions about what music you like, what food you like, you know, because prior to being 11 and 12, your parents kind of decided that stuff for you. But around about the age of um, 13, 14, I guess I was choosing my own clothes, you know, basically, and right. discovering the wonderful world of music, rock and roll. So what was the kind of music that became yours rather than your family's? If I can paint the picture for you, Ken, it's... Um, yeah, as I say, a 13-year-old Martin Fry is sitting in Bramall, a suburb of Manchester, with baked beans on his lap. Maybe some spam in there, because we <laughs> ate that sort of thing back then. Uh, wondering what the world was all about. And top of the pops, Thursday night, there was this band appeared. Roxy Music performing Virginia Plain. Clearly, they'd come from another planet, you know, <laughs> in my suburban Little world. I had never seen anything like this. You got Brian Ferry, Phil Manzanera, Brian Eno, standing there in all their kind of glam rock glory, performing a song which to me sounded like it had just come from out of space. And I think that's the kind of blueprint of everything I look for in music ever since. So I can't really understate how exciting that was uh, just to kind of be there watching them perform Virginia Plain. Beautiful, that introduces it that, straight away. Yeah. We're well, straight into it. Was it was a shock. It was a shocker than you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Virginia playing Roxy Music, chosen by Martin Fry. So, Martin, yeah, that, that had a huge impact on you, that song. Massive impact, yeah. Roxy Music were phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, what else was taking your attention at that time? I remember at school, uh, the charts would come out, I think, on Tuesday. And then... Within the school, there were different groups. There was the kind of Chicory Tip mob and the Slade guys and the Bowie and the Roxy guys. And I was a Bowie Roxy guy, you know. We'd be cheering on uh, and, and T-Rex. I mean, there was probably um, Hurricane Smith fans in the school building. I mean, you know, there were so many records on the chart. A big variety at that time, too. Massive variety. Yeah. It was just wonderful. You know, we'd kind of... It was like football. Uh, following a football team, you'd, you'd kind of trace how f you know who'd gone in the charts that week, obviously, and and uh, and where the records were going. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of emotional um, weight yeah. in those in that pop charts, I think. But for me, uh, Bolan, Mark Bolan, to anyone out there that's never really understood what an incredible pop star he was. Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain. They should make one of those biog movies like they did for Elton John and uh, yeah, they should. and for Queen about the the world of T Rex and Mark Bowen. They really should because uh, you know he is remembered today, Seismic. but perhaps because he um, he died young. Yeah, uh, people have sort of fixed him in that period, but don't look at the the overall music that he he produced and was responsible for. Bowling with the uh, Jeepster, uh, with Rider White Swan, with Hot Love, he kind of ushered in. A kind of rock and roll, hard edge, shiny version of music coming out of the seventies, I guess. Uh, he was the ultimate pop star as well, I think. Too, you know, can anyone be the ultimate pop star? He was. He was. A, he, he ticks most of those boxes. He he came as close as anybody can. But for me, uh, Children of the Revolution had it all because in it he provides a manifesto to the ne to, to the youth of the nation, and I was one of them then about how to live your life. And also, it, it contains the lines. I drive a Rolls Royce because it's good for my voice. For me, that is that's kind of a what bap a loo bap a what man boom, you know, because <laughs> the chance to write a song that's like cheeky, informative, cool, camp, ahead of the game, original, Bolin. He did all of that with T Rex or Tyrannosaurus Rex and uh, Children of the Revolution. That was my manifesto, yeah. Uh, I, and Mark Bolan, yeah, uh, he, he never took himself very seriously. That was the other thing. Yeah, I mean, Bolan, he, he had just had that fantastic combination of that massive charisma 
a serious sort of artist, but at the same time, you need you need a bit of vaudeville in your back pocket. I think you yeah. know. I think most great performers, when you look at Mick Jagger or Elton John or Freddie Mercury, they always had the bit of a bit of that vaudeville performer in touch them. of pizzazz there. A bit of that snake <laughs> <laughs> oil <laughs> salesman <laughs> is needed. You yeah. know, uh, you know. So if you look at everybody from you know Liam Gallagher to Harry Styles to Taylor Swift, they all have those yeah. qualities. Yeah. Now here's another big performer, Alice Cooper, uh, next on your list. So uh, why this? Uh, my mum came back from somewhere. I've got my brother Jamie, and she had a copy of Alice Cooper School's Out and also a copy of Bowie, uh, Aladdin Insane. And uh, I think those were the first vinyl albums that ever sort of, of any note that existed in our household. And me and my brother have always fought with each other over the years to say who owns the Skills Out copy and who owns the Aladdin Insane copy. I mean, we can afford now to buy our own copies. <laughs> I should add. <laughs> but um, I do remember uh, it's simple, really, music when it just smacks you in the face. And for me, it, it made, meant so much. Term was finishing and, and Alice Cooper brought out Skills Out. And uh, I just used to listen to the, the Radio Caroline countdown uh, with a pillow over my head. <laughs> Kids, we didn't have e uh, earphones back no. then. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I used to live furtively listen, and that this was number one. Schools Out by Alice Cooper. Brilliant. Alice Cooper, Schools Out. Instant impact on you there, Martin. I, I, all of this has happened to me in 1972. I mean, I remember living in Bramall, I used to get the train into Manchester and go to Old Trafford as a kid and watch Willie Morgan and George Best and Bobby Charlton and I guess. But then, tragically, United fans, do you remember the years when uh, Wilf McGuinness took over the management of the team and then Frank O'Farrell? And we were about set to be uh, relegated by a Dennis Law goal at the end of the season. I think it was around about this period. So whilst I was going to the match and thoroughly enjoying that, I was also kind of realising I needed another source of interest. It was too heartbreaking to see United... Manchester United kind of they were a little bit of a shadow of their former selves they came back strong later so I'd also go in Manchester go down to um, the record stores and, and just kind of flick through the vinyl and, and you know like everybody that's how we all started isn't it you know obsessing about music and, yeah. and records and daydreaming and thinking that in the corner of your eye there was a world out there that you weren't fully aware of a veiled world of rock and roll or music which was a great escape for me from the the world of my suburban, you know, home. You know, it was kind of like life was ordinary, but rock and roll wasn't. Yeah. You know? So you got a glimmer of that. A glimmer. Life. A and glimmer. That's yeah. maybe the spark that started things off. I think so. I, I mean, the path of I'm still here. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm out there having a go, standing on stages, singing songs. But um, yeah, very much so. '72 was a definitely a turnaround year for me. Yeah. I mean, every year is significant, isn't it? But for me, it was, yeah, it's definitely... Yeah, this was the, the first of real impact year. Uh, Mott the Hoople on the list now. Well, Mott the Hoople with All the Young Dudes, yeah. Um, which David Bowie wrote. Yeah. Um, and the whole concept of... Um, Bowie was a massive... Well, he was his, his star was rising in 1972. And he had... He just didn't have time to put this one out himself, did he? He had so many great songs <laughs> on cassette in his hold all. <laughs> He, he could pass this one across to Ian Hunter and Overend Watts and the other guys in uh, in Mott the Hoople and say, you know, let's hear this on the radio. So I think it's, it's testament to uh, Bowie's skills as well. But I've always loved this song, yeah. I've always loved the way it just kind of describes uh, different people's lives, yeah. I mean, music works in so many different ways, but I do like a little story in, in a lyric every now and again, yeah. And you've got David Bowie as your last choice himself. I sneaked in two Bowie songs <laughs> for good reason. Uh, like pretty much about 85% of the people in my generation, when they saw David Bowie perform Starman on top of the pops, put his arm around Mick Ronson, sing that final chorus, you just knew you were in the, ple in the in, you know, you were watching something very special, basically. And... People say to me, well, Bowie, do, he'd already had a hit with Space Oddity, but I think Starman was the first Ziggy hit, really. He he yeah. he found this persona that worked for him called Ziggy Stardust, as we all know, and there he was on top of the pops, beaming in to my part of Stockport, Cheadle Hume, Bramall, uh, 
9 Langdale Road, where I lived, he just beamed, he, again, like Roxy Music, he was beaming in from another planet. He was kind of a, almost interstellar and, and mind-blowing, yeah. So that, to me, is why Starman has to be played right. this morning. It's coming, it's coming. But first, tell us about the Rewind festivals. You're, you're going to be doing those. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, you know, I'm in, a, in ABC. I get the chance to sing um, Poison Arrow and The Look of Eleven, all those hits. Yeah. Uh, we're going out on tour, actually. We, I play a lot of festivals, but uh, we're very excited about next February when we go out on tour with full orchestra, with the South Bank Symphonia, uh, with Anne Dudley conducting and the band. Because uh, Anne Dudley was there right at the beginning, wasn't she? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anne Dudley, um, when we first started, we made an album called The Lexicon of Love with Trevor Horn producing, and Anne Dudley walked into the studios and played some piano, and we became friends then. All these years on, you know, Anne's... If you go around to Anne's house, there's like Oscars hidden away in the corner. She's very understated. Yes. We'll be very embarrassed if I yeah. say these things. But uh, <laughs> she's um, she scored incredible films, uh, Netflix series, TV shows, and uh, she was in the art of noise as well. And but she was also uh, instrumental in some of the early ABC records, The Look of Love and Poison Arrow, yeah. and All of My Heart. So we hooked up, and we've been playing a show an orchestral uh, show for a good few years now. So we get the chance to start off, I think, in Brighton, February the 5th, all the way through to the London Palladium, uh, February the 17th, and tickets yeah. go on sale on Friday. Well, indeed they do, and I've got the, the whole list here, which I'll go through again for everybody afterwards. So, uh, we, yeah, going to all the, the Birmingham Symphony Hall, uh, Bridgewater Hall in Manchester, the big, big venues and important venues, and people will turn out in their droves to see you. I know, Martin. Um I've noticed, though, in recent years that uh, the merchandise has changed for us. We, we, we kind of released the super deluxe version of Lexicon of Love, which came out 40 years ago and all that. But um, I can't really do the T-shirts and the caps anymore, you know. No. It's going a lot more luxe now when you come to see ABC and their full-blown orchestra show. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, if you, if you need a, a, a wallet or... Um, or a tuxedo, oh, come right. to the show. Oh, well, yeah, okay. it's all about the um, celebrity-endorsed merch these days, I'm told. Excellent. Yeah. I'll be right along for mine. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Lovely to see you, Martin. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for choosing those. Uh... 1972. What a year. What a fantastic year. Good man. Thank you. Thank you.